too. Anyway, since we seem to be out of witnesses, I thought I'd drink a little. And there we are. We're here again. Tyler, how's your week? It's a fantastic and busy week, uh, but yeah, fantastic. How about you? Uh, yeah, it's all right. You know, this COVID thing's still kind of crazy and yeah, sort of practicing and sort of not completely. Uh, the practicing you mean social distancing or practicing law yeah a little bit of a and a little bit of b <laughs> spent a lot of time in the office tending to business stuff instead of work stuff which is what creates income so yeah. i wouldn't say it was a profitable week but uh it wasn't a bad week the weather was pretty nice and uh until last day or two yeah we had some nice weather i uh uh, of course, we have no childcare now, so my wife and I we take turns parenting. And we spend a great deal of time outside this week, uh, watching construction and stuff going on around our house. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It was a good week. Nice, nice. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so today we talked about this a little bit earlier, like uh, the topic du jour, as it were. Um, uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, before we start, straight law cocktail. Again, three quarter ounce of gin, one and a half ounces of uh, dry sherry. Cocktail shaker with a little bit of ice. Pour it into a uh, martini glass. Slice of orange. Salute. Cheers. I'm having a, uh, a Richard's Tennessee whiskey with Coke today. And it's a fairly nice whiskey. People might be a little critical that I mix it with Coke, but I heard that it is uh, International Have a Coke Day. And I'm right. not going to for Coca-Cola uh, just because it's the superior cola. Uh, I just enjoy it. So cheers. Oh, and if you disagree with me, leave a comment on our page. <laughs> there you go. Uh, what kind of uh, Tennessee whiskey? Uh, Pritchard's. Hey, Frank Sinatra was a big Jack and Coke guy. That's right. So if it's good enough for Frank, uh, it's good enough for Tyler. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so uh, the topic du jour. Um, I mean, there's a million things we could talk about. Uh, last couple uh, weeks we've been talking about COVID. I'm tired of that. Uh, we're coming out of it. Everyone's going to be fine, apparently. Uh, it was all misunderstanding. It was never as serious as we thought it was, allegedly. Um, uh, the topic I thought we'd talk about today uh, is it's about access to justice. And there's a few things uh, that uh, crystallized that idea in my mind this week. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I came across an article uh, in the Globe and Mail, actually, uh, with an excerpt of a speech that uh, former Supreme Court of Canada Judge Rosalia Bella gave uh, at Harvard Law, where she talked about uh, access to justice. And as we know, if anyone uh, pays any attention to the media, the Supreme Court of Canada is very fond of talking about access to justice, which on a certain level, I guess, is pretty positive. It's something that we need to... Uh, be serious about. Um, but I guess I'm a little jaded, Tyler. Maybe I'm an old guy. I've been around, seen a few things. But Rosalie Bella, you know, Supreme Court of Canada telling us we've got to approve access to justice. Bev McLaughlin, a former chief judge, uh, we need to improve access to justice. Of course, we had the Cromwell report from Thomas Cromwell. Another Supreme Court of Canada judge did the uh, relatively famous in the profession uh, report on access to justice, telling us we need to improve access to justice. And I can't help it, but I get a little agitated um, when I feel like those of us who are in the trenches, if I can use that term, on the streets, if you will, we understand the problems. And when I get lectured by someone in an ivory tower from the Supreme Court of Canada who likely has never really had to grapple 
face to face with access to justice, uh, I get a little bit edgy. Do you get any sense of that? You're a younger lawyer. You've only been around for a few years. Does it ever bother you when you read about that stuff from people that really don't understand in a very direct way what it is that we do? Yeah, that is frustrating, right? And there's sort of like these different levels it almost seems where the first thing when we talk about access to justice, the first thing that comes into people's minds are, man, we got these rich lawyers getting paid all this money and they should charge less and they should they should do more and do more pro bono. And that's sort of like, to me, this basic kind of, you know, entry level concept about how to talk about access to justice. And I think that most of the dialogue has gone beyond that. Now, to answer your question, yeah, that's a little tough when you got a ju a, a, some justices and the higher up we go, the harder it is to, you know, bear uh, telling us, you know, we got access to justice issues. You don't have to tell us, holy cow, <laughs> do we know? But maybe the comments aren't for us. Now, Abella was specifically talking, I believe, to, uh, uh, you know, graduates, uh, you know, I mean, with even less experience than I, uh, if you can believe it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that's a good place to start, to, to recognize that there's this problem and then talk about what do we do about it. But here's an interesting thought. When did you get called, Tyler? 2016, June. Okay, so you're basically coming on four years. Uh, yeah. So it, it might be of interest to you that you have more litigation experience than two of the three judges I've just mentioned. Well, or at least as much. That might be interesting to our viewers. That doesn't surprise right? it doesn't so, surprise so, and, and, and I don't want to diminish their capacity as Supreme Court judges, because that's a whole different thing. Um, the ability to distill argument and, and law at that level uh, is significant. So, but uh, Justice Abella, to begin with, she got called 1972. She practiced for four years to 1976. Four years of litigation experience. Um, Justice McLaughlin, she called in 1969. She practiced until 1975. Seven years. So she has you beat. Justice Cromwell practiced from 1979 to 1982. Three years. And, and so again, I don't want to diminish what they do as judges of the Supreme Court because the contribution is significant and the task that they engage in is monumental. But my point is, they don't understand what they're talking about when they talk about access to justice. There is no way in hell that a judge with three or four years of experience can understand what it's like, for example, practicing for over 30 years, in my case, and having to tell the single mothers that you can't deliver justice to them because they don't have enough money. I don't know how many times I've had to have that discussion. My guess is, and I might be wrong and it might be unfair, my guess is the justices we've spoken about who have been somewhat outspoken on access issues have probably never had that conversation or they certainly haven't had it to the extent that you have and definitely not me. So, so that's kind of my problem. And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm a little bit uh, agitated today um, a woman I consider a friend, uh, she's a fellow board member on a thing called the National Self-Represented Litigants Project that I'm involved with. Um, she came to me probably about a year or so ago and she said, um, I think my husband's not paying enough child support and I'd like to review that. And I said, okay. Um, she goes, but I don't really have any money. So I said, all right, uh, let me see if I can help you out. And she's in Vancouver and I'm here. So uh, I did a little bit of research to figure out how to just get disclosure of financial information. And I had no idea that what a pain in the ass it is in British Columbia. I thought Alberta was a pain in the ass. British Columbia is worse, right? Alberta, you file a thing called Notice to Disclose. It's a one-page document, basically. It's a form document. You put the action number and the names of the parties in. That's it. You file it, serve it. Um, in BC, you got to bring an application, right? Oh. 
So what happens is uh, I get her into the court. She brings the application and the husband is a monumentally wealthy asshole. Just be blunt. And so he hires a commercial lawyer from downtown Vancouver who immediately writes her a letter saying, well, this has to go to a hearing and a trial. This can't be dealt with in a open chambers. And if you don't agree to adjourn it for a few months, we're going to come and seek costs, right? And so she phones me in a kerfuffle because she doesn't know what to do. And I explain to her how this lawyer's just being a prick. And he doesn't know what he's talking about, or he does, and he's misrepresenting what the situation is. And so she stands up to him, and the judge has none of it. And the judge orders this guy to disclose. Perfect. And so she gets the disclosure. But the problem then is he files a responding application to change the parenting for no particularly good reason. But why not when you've got unlimited money in your pocket and you're dealing with a single mother of limited resources, why not grind her using the system, which is what he does. So what then happens is she has to hire a lawyer. So she borrows money. She hires a Vancouver lawyer because I can't go to Vancouver to practice. And they have a hearing, not an oral hearing, not witnesses, um, but a hearing. And she's somewhat successful. But at the end of the day, to read the decision, rather than finding his income at a certain amount and giving child support appropriate to that, the judge sort of does a bit of a saw off, but she does increase the support. At the end of the day, the legal fees for this woman are $90,000, 90 grand, right? Um, and the cost award she gets doesn't touch that. I, I can't remember offhand, but I think it was less than a third. So now she's in deep shit because she's got significant outstanding legal fees and they haven't dealt with the child hearing yet, which is pointless, but nonetheless, the judge sets it for a hearing actually later this month. And so I had an email from, uh, uh, from a person involved with the program that asks, can I help her? And the problem is um, not really, not from here, not from Alberta. And so she's in a jam because she has to go to court and the lawyer that she had won't act anymore because she owes that lawyer money, $90,000 in legal fees. And so that coupled with Justice Abella telling us how access needs to be improved, it kind of got my blood boiling a little bit because this is just unfortunately so typical of what the system does. Our system is great for wealthy people and it's really, really shitty for people that aren't wealthy. And we've done not a lot as a profession to change that. And the government hasn't done a lot to change that. And the important thing is, and I mentioned this once when I met Justice Cromwell actually, is the judges haven't done a lot to change that. Everybody stands around pointing their fingers at the other guy. Um, and this poor woman is now in a situation where she's worried about her daughter because she's 90,000 in the hole without a lawyer. Yeah. So yeah, so this is why I'm a little on edge today. Um, in, and I don't know what we do with that. Like, wh what are your thoughts? Well, let's slow I'm down. I kind of pontificated you know, there for a bit. <laughs> yeah, you did. Let's slow down a little. So. I mean, I want to talk a bit about what Abella said. So now I read just an excerpt of what Abella said. And I mean, it rang true with me and maybe you don't care for the source as much and, and I can appreciate. I've looked lots of clients in the eyes and said, yeah, you, you can't afford to have, to have justice on this one. We gotta, you gotta make it go away. And uh, I've had to tell clients, yeah, I can't keep helping you. Uh, you know, I've got, uh, you know, I got my own bills to pay. I got, paying clients lined up who are demanding work. Uh, so, I mean, I, I get that. I get it. Um, but Abella did seem to be, to, 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 it rang true with me at least, right? So Abella said, look, it goes beyond legal fees and it goes beyond pro bono work. Um, and then she even says, look, it goes beyond even, um, uh, you know, talking about alternative dispute resolutions like mediation and arbitration. But then she kind of leaves us hanging a little. Well, what is it then, right? So that's the question. And, you know, the, what she was talking about was, look, you know, everything else in the world has changed. She, I think she talked about the, the, the year 1906. Everything has changed, but not the judicial system. She said, you get a good litigator from 1906, throw them in a courtroom today, 
uh, they're going to find their way around. They'll be all right. Uh, and that's an interesting point. So it all rang pretty true with me, but where does that leave us? And there was some suggestion from, um, from Abella that, you know, uh, if it goes beyond mediation and arbitration, we need a better system. It goes beyond our system. Uh, it sounded to me like maybe she was indicating the judicial system needs to change to a better system, which I think is probably the case. But I think you and I, maybe you disagree with me, I think you and I would probably agree that there's better systems and we use them. We use mediation. You know, if, if that's going to be successful, great. Uh, it doesn't need, in my opinion, to be an alternative dispute resolution. It should be a dispute resolution mechanism uh, and one that we should rely on primarily if we can. Uh, there's arbitration, right? So arbitration is this idea. It's sort of like hiring a private judge, but we can control that system, right? So when we talk about courts and litigation, there's specific rules, there's rules of evidence, there's procedure, it's expensive, it's time consuming. And that's what Abella addresses. Look, arbitration, we can kind of craft that to what we want it to be, right? Um, so I okay, think but, that but let's talk about arbitration. So I'm an arbitrator, um, along with arbitrators in Calgary and a few arbitrators in Lethbridge, we've put our name out there as being ready, willing, and able to do arbitration right now when the judicial system has been shut down under COVID. Yeah. No hires. Now, maybe that's me. I talked to the other arbitrators in Lethbridge, no hires. Jeez. I talked to the arbitrators in Calgary, very few hires. So why do you suppose that is? I think that, honestly, I think it's because lawyers uh, are on this hamster wheel of practicing law and running litigation. And that's what we do. That's what we're trained to do. That's what we're good at. And we get these other little courses about ADR, alternative dispute resolution, and these other things. But then we get into the practice and our mentors are showing us look, this is how you run files. This is how you generate fees. This is how you get resolution. And everyone's caught in this hamster wheel. And that's why I think that's the case. I don't know if the answer is that we need the government to change the system to mandate that the judiciary is something other than what it is, or that we need to have, I mean, to change it, yeah, but we need changes. I'm not saying that it has to be completely different from what it is. The options seem to be available. People aren't choosing it. So, so I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because I've thought about Good. this for a while. Good. Yeah. You, well, yeah, sure. And I think part of the reason that mediation and arbitration and litigation doesn't work is precisely because of this case I told you about, right? So particularly in family law, when people come to court, there's usually one person that has control of something that they don't want to let control of mm -hmm. go. So if you're the guy with the money, you don't want to get more money. You like the way things are right now. Sometimes it's a flip. Sometimes it's a parenting issue. And if you're the parent that has the child most of the time, you don't really want to change that. Call that status quo at law, the way things are right now, right? Okay, good. Yeah. And so what happens is, use litigation, right? This clown in Vancouver, and his cadre of lawyers, it was to his benefit to drag this thing out and to make the woman spend as much money to get him to the courtroom as is humanly possible. For him to be able to sit on that status quo had tremendous value for him. And making her fight for that made it much more difficult and often just dissuades people from doing anything. Yes, it does. Now, arbitration. So I've thought about this too. So why are people calling us for arbitration? It's actually probably cheaper uh, in many cases than litigation, even if you got to pay the arbitrator because you can streamline it. Yeah, you can control the process. And my theory is um, there's lots of people right now that want to arbitrate something, but you have to have both people agree. Yeah. That's how arbitration is. And if you have the status quo, so you have money, you don't want to give it up. You have parenting time that you don't want to give up. Why would I agree to arbitration right now in COVID? Why don't I just sit here and sit on the thing that I like, whether it's my own income or my control of my child, um, and screw arbitration. And the same issue with mediation, right? Mediation, people go into it if you can get them there, which is not always easy. The person that has already what they want 
it's in their interest to drag the situation out to avoid the inevitable. Yeah. And I think that's really problematic. You know, uh, I did a lot of collaborative law, not so much now, but I was one of the first lawyers in, in Alberta, along with uh, Janice Pritchard and a few others that brought it to Alberta. I was former president of Collaborative Lawyers of Alberta. And you would find that it became really expensive. And in my opinion, because you'd have one person usually that didn't really want to change the status quo. Yeah. Right. And collaborative law ended up getting really expensive and people had meetings and meetings and meetings and things weren't happening. Um, so, so that's kind of, I think, a, a larger part of the problem of getting people to arbitration. I think you're right. I think lawyers like what they know, what, what is simple from their point of view. I think that's part of it. But I also think it's, well, why deal with this today if I can put it off for two months? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm not going to disagree. I think that that's an excellent point. What if the, the clown in Vancouver or you know, the person who wants the status quo, what if they get some solid legal advice that says, look, the inevitable is going to happen. You're going to have to pay child support that's commensurate with your income. Uh, that's the law. They're going to get disclosure. Eventually that's going to happen. Now, you can pay me a bunch of money. It's probably better off going to your family. Uh, or, you know, if we have a, a, a leg to stand, on, if we want to make some legal arguments or whatever, uh, uh, shouldn't the advice from that good lawyer be, let's engage in a process that's cheaper, easier, arguably better justice. Uh, and that's what I give my clients, right? If I had a client sitting here telling me, no, 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 drag it out, stall, stall, stall. And you know what? I <laughs> recently had this. Uh, I'm not keeping you. That's not the point. The point isn't delay and outspend the other. Um, that's not the game I think that good lawyers need to play. So I think the, lawyers be a game the client plays. Could be the game the, cl the client plays. You're right. So I think the lawyers have a role in that. So, okay, so are we generating some sort of knowledge here? Are we getting somewhere with this? Is there maybe room for a government to mandate um, that? another form of dispute resolution occur? Well, I think they have to, right? I think as you, as long as you offer the alternative for people with pockets full of money to drag things out and to use the system effectively to shake down the other party, they're gonna do it, right? So lawyers, and, and actually, you know, the number of lawyers I know that push clients to mediation, including myself and you and others, is pretty staggering, really. Mm. Um, but in the face of that, I think the government has to basically say to litigants, you don't get to drag out litigation for two or three years. That's not your option. Right. Um, and, and it makes me, the, the thing that, that, it, and I've had people say this and I've thought it, that, that there's this axiom that you often see if you go to a, a, a garage, I've seen this on, on service shop walls all over the world. And I'm going to share it. I, I downloaded uh, uh, one of these pictures. Put it up on the screen, yeah. Uh, right? You've seen this? Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, you know, you can have three kinds of service, good, cheap, or fast. You can only pick two. If it's good and cheap, it won't be fast. If it's fast and cheap, it won't be good. If it's good and fast, it won't be cheap. Right? That is... Uh, has often been used to talk about justice, except justice is worse in my opinion. Because first of all, you can't choose two, right? The law societies and the judges pretty much tell you, you can't get fast. And really they tell you, you can't get cheap. All we offer is good, right? Um, there's a case that just came down a week or two ago, a uh, mediator in Calgary um, uh, was found to be negligent because there wasn't enough disclosure in the mediation when the client sort of had buyer's remorse after a deal was made and, and he found the lawyer should have done more to get disclosure and, you know, to turn over more rocks. And, and basically what that judge was saying, because the client made the agreement and the client wasn't disabled and if the client really felt they wanted more information, they could have asked for it. And I will almost guarantee you the lawyer told them that. But yet, 
the Monday morning quarterback, right? The justice in question, when all is said and done and the client's not happy, goes, well, lawyer, you didn't do good enough. So you delivered justice quicker and you probably delivered it cheaper, but that's not the choice the client gets. And you should know that. Their choice is good. I don't give a shit how expensive it is and how long it takes. They're going to get good, right? So the shitty thing is you can go to a service shop and a mechanic and you can go, yeah, give me the good, fast service, even if it's not, you know, yeah. cheap. You don't get that with lawyers in the legal system today. And, no, you and, and, the, and the unfortunate thing is you don't even necessarily get good. No, you, yeah, that's true. Right? Now, uh, most lawyers are pretty good. Most judges are pretty good. But on their not so good days, some lawyers aren't very good at all. And we see judges that aren't very good at all. On occasion, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so to me, if if and I've had this discussion. I used to be the chair of the Access to Justice Committee for the Law Society, and I was involved with a forming family justice program in Alberta for a while. I've been to the equal justice seminars and from Vancouver to, to Nova Scotia. And I've said this before to a few judges. And I said, you know, we could offer real fast, neutral justice by flipping a coin. Yeah, we could. Right. And I'm not saying we want to do that, but maybe we need to deconstruct justice and start with that premise of how quick and cheap can we make it and have it tolerable. And no one's having that conversation, in my opinion. Yeah, you're They're right. all nibbling around the edges. They're all trying to change a shitty system that can't accommodate what we need and do something that it needs to be, which is accessible to everyone equally, that doesn't allow wealthy people to abuse people that have less wealth, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I'd like to see that conversation from, you know, our Supreme Court, from our ministers of justice, from our law societies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we need to deconstruct the system. You know, it, it, this is before your time. I started practicing in 1985. And we go to chambers, affidavits, affidavit, judge will make a decision, 10 minutes. There's almost never a thing called a special. And the quality of justice in my mind wasn't that much different, but it was a hell of a lot cheaper and quicker. Yeah. And I think we need to move back towards that less perfect justice personally. Um, and that would help equal the playing field a little bit. The other thing you should do, my opinion, is cost awards as a rule should indemnify, not as an exception, right? So if you lose, you pay the other lawyer bill as a rule. Bang. So for our to get more reasonable. What that means. If so this right asshole in Vancouver had to pay this woman ninety thousand dollars after that first hearing, he's gonna think twice about running that child parenting hearing. Hell yeah. But so, as it is, ninety thousand dollars is nothing to him, knowing that she's gonna be in the hole maybe forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars when it's done. There we are. So right now, as it stands, if I'm going to advise a client on well, what are legal costs, uh, you know, I can tell them specifically how it works that, you know, there's a schedule in the rules of court that describes how much you get, the certain steps to be taken. But roughly, I give them an idea. And it's going to work out to be if you're wholly successful on a good day and you have a little luck on your side, you're going to get about a third of what you pay your lawyer in legal mm -hmm. costs. Um, yeah, that's about what I say. Yeah, and that's not good. That you're right. That's the problem. That gives people the confidence to say, "Go, yeah, let's go ahead, uh, run, run it up. Let's take our time. Let's try and spend that other person into the ground." Yeah, that's harm, big problem. And you know what? Uh, I think we could put that on our justices a little bit. Maybe as lawyers, we need to take that on to push our justices a little yeah. more to be a little more serious about costs. I had a yeah. hearing uh, that concluded this year. It was a five day trial uh we have an expert witness uh you know my client spent upwards of 40 grand it was over a couple years the other side stalled delayed spent 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 hired this uh expert uh, to testify hopefully on their behalf the expert actually found you know against them uh, and testified such and 
at the end of the day, the judge was ready to call costs a wash on the basis that this guy paid for an expert, even though the expert wasn't even in his favor, and we're essentially 100% successful. Um, and I pushed a little bit and said, you know, well, this is something we got to dive into. This is not. And so you can guess what happened. Of course, the judge says, all right, well, you know what? I'll give you another day to argue about costs. And I want some written submissions first. And I'll give you a decision in three or four months. Of course, in the meantime, my client's paying 27% interest on a credit card that she's racked up in legal fees, uh, still owes me some money. Of course, I've taken some big write-offs uh, in her favor because, of course, I'm you know, compassionate uh, for her case that, that she was basically su wholly successful on. She's taken on loans from family members. You know, they've, they've sacrificed on her behalf as well. And now, okay, we get to incur some more time, with, you know, some more expense, and we get to wait. And eventually, we were uh, a lot more successful on the costs front. Uh, but I think that maybe that's something that us lawyers got to do is we got to push a little bit on that and say, you know, judge, uh, here's the rules, here's the law, and we're deserving of some costs here. And we got to push that. And maybe, you know, if that means we got to run an appeal here and there, uh, try and maybe set a higher standard, maybe that's on us. Oh, yeah. And it is in part, right? But, and not even maybe so much us as I'm going to make the argument, right? My client loses. I'm going to try and argue they shouldn't pay costs or the cost should be marginal. That's my job. Yeah. But I should probably lose more of those arguments. Yeah. And when I'm on the other side, I should win more. And if we got to a point where judges were awarding costs on a full indemnity basis or something akin to that, and I got to say this honestly as well, you know, you tell clients you need to bring your disclosure in, right? How many clients bring you all their disclosure, right? Yeah, and you right. tell them, look, if you don't bring it in, it's going to cost you more money because I got to spend more time. If we don't get it done in time, you run the risk of a cost order, right? And so they don't. The other lawyer knows. They don't want to go to court to get a cost order. Well, can you give it to me next week, the week after? These things drag out. A month after you should have got the disclosure and you still don't have it, they get fed up. They go to court and say, look, I need this, that, the other thing. The judge orders it. To this point, that application, maybe it costs them $1,500, $2,000, cost award, right? And my own client in that case, who's been dilatory, okay, 500 bucks, right? Um, so again, yeah, we could do more, but it would make it easier for us if we could be very direct with our clients and say, you're going to get hammered if you don't do what you ought to do. And oh, by the way, if we run a hearing and you lose, you're going to get hammered. And it would make people more reasonable. Uh, it would make lawyers a little more accountable because the lawyers have to be pretty straight with their client. You know, you couldn't kind of bullshit them. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be a help. But I think, you know, streamlining the process, uh, making justice quicker, but maybe less better uh, is something we should look at. No, I should uh, mention, I did see that uh, the rules did amend the costs uh, according to the schedule. I think just last week, we, somewhat, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, I, but it's not, it doesn't change what we've talked about in any sense. No, and they're still not full indemnity, not even close. Oh, no, no. yeah, no. I, my, what I'm going to tell my clients would be the same as what I've told them before. You know, yeah. good day, you're looking at maybe a third of what your costs are going to actually be. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's my thought for the day. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to keep going. We've, I, I was hoping we could make these things a little bit shorter, good, more direct. Um, uh, I did want to give a shout out though. We talk about this woman, uh, your good friend and mine, uh, former lawyer with Huckvale, uh, Ryan C. Ryan Chan, is a lawyer in Vancouver, and he has offered to meet with this woman to give her some advice anyway. And so uh, the little quid pro quo, I did text him this afternoon and I said, I'll give you a shout out on our YouTube channel. Uh, and he agreed to uh, give this woman uh, a little free legal advice. Well then cheers um, to you, C. Ryan Chan. So there's two, C. Ryan Chan, working in uh, Lotus Land, Vancouver. Thank so you. I'm hoping the baseball season is shortly upon us. Go Red <laughs> Sox. Um, it is uh, my dear wife's birthday today. Happy birthday, Marcy. Happy birthday. And uh, we are actually just uh, 
on her way to the office. And she oh. made a cake for her own birthday. They were going to share with uh, Alan and uh, Tammy. All right, well, or you, if you're going to go over there. Yeah, you know what? I've got some parenting news. I don't think I can have So I don't think I'm Well, gonna... that takes priority. Yeah, it's got it. No, yeah, no child care right now. So no, I hear it. I hear it. Well, you have a good weekend. It's Thank been you. fun as always. And again, anyone, if you have questions, comments, uh, make a comment on YouTube, we'll respond to it. Send us an email, uh, hdplaw.ca, we can get a hold of us, and uh, see you next week. See you next week, everybody. Ciao.